Morning, brothers and sisters, visitors. Amazing God's work. Amazing that He set a day aside in His creation and He created it in six days and put a day of rest. And we may enjoy this, this day of rest to worship God. And it's just His wonderful work. He called us together, that we together for His glory and uh, let Him be glorified in this, uh, this hour of worship. Uh, glory to our God. He is the only and living God. Even as we uh, others uh, have a pagan worship, we worship the only true God, living God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Um, let us um, start our worship in preparing ourselves for worship by um, singing together number 211. 211. Good morning, church family, and a very good welcome, uh, warm welcome to those who are visiting and, of course, those who are with us online. We know that all of life is worship, but, of course, the Lord calls us, especially on this day, His day, to worship Him together as God's people. And we hear this call to worship Him from Psalm 33. Shout for joy to the Lord, O you righteous Praise befits the upright, for the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfastness of the Lord. Well, let's come now in a, a moment of silent prayer as we bow our heads and pray.
pray in our heads to the Lord, asking that he would quieten our hearts and humble us before him in this hour of worship. Let's do that now. Our Father in heaven, you hear our prayers. We ask that in this hour of worship, you would help us by your Spirit's power to shout for joy to you and to give you all the praise and the honor and the glory due your name. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Please stand. As always, as the people of God, we acknowledge that our help is in the name of God, the maker of the heavens and the earth. And he's a God who speaks to us and in reply says, Grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, let's remain standing and we will sing number 92, How Good It Is to Thank the Lord, the verses 1 to 2 and verse 5. seated. It's fitting for us now to come before our Lord in a time of prayer, lifting up his name on high and giving him all thanks and asking that he would open our eyes uh, in this hour of worship. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we lift your name on high. We thank you that you are uh, the God, the maker, the creator of all things, the heavens and the earth and all they contain. And Father, we thank you so much that you are not a God who is far removed, who lives out there. But Father, you live amongst us. You are uh, present with us by your spirit. And we thank you so much, Father, that as you call us to worship you, you are indeed here with us and you hear us. We thank you uh, that you have given us your word that we may know uh, what it is to live for our God, uh, to live for him, to live for you because of all that you have done for us in Christ. Thank you for the lives that we live. Thank you that we can uh, live them in honor and glory of your name. Help us to do that uh, now in this hour of worship. And we know that that can only happen when you open our eyes and our hearts uh, to your word as you speak to us through your word as you speak to us in the preaching of your word and 
also how you move our hearts as we sing your praises and as we come to you in prayer. Thank you so much, Father, and thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, people of God, the gospel simply isn't the gospel or the good news for you if you don't acknowledge and confess your sin. You see, it's the the elephant in the room every time you try to hide it or pretend that it doesn't exist. You see, without an acknowledgement of our sin, the grace of God has no present glory if the sin that it overcomes isn't a present reality. And the ministry of Christ in our lives has no significance if the sin that he came to defeat isn't even faced or acknowledged in our lives. Let's open our Bibles to Psalm 32. We're going to read there the first six verses of Psalm 32. In your visitor's Bible, you'll find that on page 462. Psalm 32, hear the psalmist testify, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly Offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. Brothers and sisters, therefore, let all of you who would know God's forgiveness, not, let's not keep silent, but rather confess your sin and ask his forgiveness. Let's do that now in a time of prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for your blessed words of assurance that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just, and you forgive us all our sins, and you purify us from all unrighteousness. Father, help us to be honest about our sin that offends you. Let us not downplay it or or minimize it or, or try and sweep it under the carpet. For Father, when we do that, we, we kid ourselves and we grieve you. And more than that, we, we actually condemn ourselves by denying your saving grace to us in Christ. So Father, we ask, restore to us the joy of your salvation. Heal our broken hearts. Refresh our souls anew as you wash us clean by the saving power and work of the precious our precious Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, let's stand now and sing the words of, uh, I will sing of my Redeemer. And, And let's remember that each time we confess our sins and we ask for forgiveness, we recommit our lives to him. So let's do that now as we stand and sing number 218, I will sing of my Redeemer.
Please be seated. Our God who forgives is with us. And as we come now in this time of worship, we uh, come to him in a time of congregational prayer. Let's do that now. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you are with us and you indeed hear us. And Lord, as we come to you in this time of prayer, we're so thankful for the week that you have just given us and all the opportunities that you have given us to live for you and the works that you prepared in advance for us to do in Christ. And Father, we ask, may you bless our sanctified efforts for you. May you bless them with the fruit you so choose in our homes, in our work, at school, and with our neighbours. Father, continue to remind us of your saving grace and that all we do for you is in Christ, who has enabled and empowered us by the Holy Spirit to live for you. And Father, we thank you for uh, your uh, evidence of being amongst us, thankful for your continued healing uh, for the many in our congregation uh, who have uh, are sick or have been sick. Uh, Lord, we continue to pray and thank you for your healing power amongst us. We thank you so much for the way that you have blessed uh, the church family here at Dovedale with, with many families, uh, for mums and dads and, and children. We thank you for that blessing. And Father, we ask that you would help us to show an, an unbelieving world the way that you intended families to live. And Lord, we pray that you would help us in our family contexts, um, whether it's just husband and wife or husband, wife and children, wherever we find ourselves, that we would show the world that this is the way that you created things to be. Lord, we know it's difficult because we do live in a world which uh, is more and more opposed to uh, the ways that you have ordained things to be uh, with a marriage between a husband and wife. Uh, and so, Lord, we ask that you would give us strength uh, to live emboldened, uh, yet humbly, uh, before an unbelieving world. We ask that you would strengthen and preserve our marriages uh, during the many ups and downs uh, of life. Pray that you would help us in our marriages to, to seek to serve rather than be served. Father, expose to us selfish hearts uh, that we may ask your forgiveness, uh, receive your forgiveness and live in light of that forgiveness. Of your grace and your mercy to us and may we show that in our love for one another as husbands and wives and indeed um, amongst one another as brothers and sisters. Help us in our marriages to, sh- uh, to, to uh, see the distinctives of marriage as you created it, as a reflection actually of the church, which we see uh, pictured as the bride of Christ, uh, Christ who laid down his life for the church. And may husbands, how they love their wives in this way, show also the love of Christ as they love their wives with self-sacrificial hearts and attitudes being willing to to put aside any selfish motivations or desires that hinder our marriage and instead put on Christ. I pray that you would help uh, husbands and fathers to lead well in all aspects of life, particularly, Lord, as um, being good, uh, godly, spiritual leaders for both their wife and their family. We pray for the continued comfort and care of the elderly and, and the lonely and the sick within our congregation. Lord, may you surround them with your, your peace and with your care and with your love. And may they uh, feel your nearness, uh, Lord, as they uh, read your word, as they pray to you, as they, uh, as they tune in to uh, the services or when, uh, being here also uh, in worship. May they feel your comfort and your nearness. Help us in our gospel witness also uh, to be a light to the world around us. Lord, help us to speak uh, winsomely and engagingly with with our unbelieving work colleagues or friends. And may we show the truth of the gospel. Pray for our young people too. And uh, Lord, we thank you for the the youth of our church. And we thank you that you are raising up uh, these young people uh, in your ways and we ask that they would continue to to be uh, strengthened and that they would uh, 
continue to uh, really see the blessings that there are in serving you with their lives. We pray for our covenant children, those who have turned their back on God. Uh, we plead with you, Father, that you would not leave them in their unbelief, but Lord, if it is your will, we, we plead that you would bring them to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we also thank you for uh, the many ministries that are, that are taking place here in this congregation. Lord, we thank you that your word has been indeed uh, brought to, to um, many people. And we think of um, uh, Bruce, Bruce's classes, the, the English um, speaking classes, and we thank you that your word has been uh, taught there as well. And, and we do ask that that would uh, also uh, bear fruit and that many who are being taught there, uh, Lord, would continue to grow. And even those who, who don't have a living faith with you uh, at this time, Lord, that you would, in fact, uh, use these opportunities, these uh, teaching classes as an opportunity to bring people to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that you hear us in all things. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, the, the theme uh, and the, the message, the preaching of God's word this morning is continuing on in James. And we'll be looking at James chapter 3. We won't be opening up there just yet. Uh, but of course, James 3 is about taming the tongue. And my question is here, who of us doesn't struggle with that? Uh, in our text from James this morning, he has a few timely reminders about the taming of the tongue. But before we get there, it's always good to remember that whenever we hear from either the Old Testament or the New Testament, that the whole of God's Word speaks to us as a unified whole. And so what we're going to do now is open up to Psalm 34, and that's our Old Testament reading for this morning. And this psalm is, is written by David, and it was a time when he was on the run from King Saul, who was, was ruthlessly hunting him down, and, and there was much opportunity for David to say many unkind words towards King Saul. But indeed in the psalm we'll see that David chooses to point out rather the blessing it is to keep our tongue from evil and our lips from speaking deceit. So Brother Paul will read that for us now, Psalm uh, Psalm 34, it's on page 463 on the little blue Bibles. You may have picked one uh, from the foyer, page uh, 463. Hear the word of God, Psalm 34, of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise, praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes it's boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord. He answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who love, who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and deliver them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days, that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Thus far, far God's word. Thank you, brother. <clears throat> Moses uh, said to the Israelites, the people of God, 
The best of your first fruits of your ground you shall bring into the house of the Lord. Now we may read this Old Testament text and think, well, we don't physically bring first fruits of the ground to the church, but we are to bring our best to God. To give willingly and thankfully our first fruits for God's kingdom and the giving of our free will offerings. So now ask the deacon to come forward and pray over the offerings that have been given during the week and perhaps uh, on the way into church this morning. Thank you. Congregation, let us pray. Dear Father, you are our eternal God. You have safely brought us through another week, another week where we could serve you in the workplace, school, or wherever our calling is. And may it have been done in your name and not out of selfish gain. Our Father, guard our hearts, and may we, in bringing our offerings to you now or electronically, store up treasures in your kingdom. May your peace, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Holy Spirit, be with us now in this hour of worship. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our next song, number 362, Blessed, Blessed Jesus at Your Word. It's actually a prayer asking for the illumination of the Holy Spirit as we gather around God's Word. So let's stand and sing that now, asking that God would in fact open our hearts and our minds before the preaching of His Word. Number 362, Blessed Jesus at Your Word. Let's stand. Open up your Bibles now to James chapter 3. We will be reading the text for this morning's sermon. James chapter 3. In your visitor's Bible, you'll find that on page 1012. And we'll be reading there the verses 1 through to 12, that section entitled, Taming the Tongue. Hear now God's word. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all humble, sorry, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. 
Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I've entitled this morning's sermon, Taming the Tongue. I think it would be true to say that the words that roll off our tongues can, at any given moment, reveal so much about us. We can seem very wise in the eyes of others until we quite quickly say something that's quite unfitting for the occasion. And so a rather hasty or, or an uninformed comment about something you really have no idea about can very quickly unravel as the room fills with sideways glances, an awkward silence, or a quick change of subject. And our tongue very easily leads us into unnecessary sin as well. Proverbs 10 verse 19 says, When words are many, transgression is not lacking. In other words, the, the less we say that, I mean it's true, isn't it? The less likely we are to come out with that juicy bit of gossip or, or that harsh word spoken in anger or, or that sarcastic comment that cuts so deeply. And so that means there's a lot at stake any time words roll off our tongue. I mean, just think about it. Empires, reputations, even prominent church leaders have risen and fallen over ill-timed words. It's literally as fragile as that when we consider both the influence and the power that our words carry. And today, James reveals that influence, the, the power and the potential for destruction that our tongues possess. And his warning is that there's a lot at stake whenever words roll off our tongue. Do they reveal that you strive to walk humbly before your God? Do they reveal that you love mercy? Do they reveal that you act justly? Because when they don't, there's a lot at stake. So as we look at today's text, we're going to see why. Now, although James appears to randomly open up chapter 3 with this reference to teachers and teaching, the first point that he wants to draw our attention to is words of influence. Words of influence. He says there, Not many of you should become teachers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now, if we put this in its context, many in the Jewish culture of the, the day, they aspired to, to be leaders. They looked up to the leaders of the day. Uh, it carried, or they carried much mana, as we would say today in New Zealand. Uh, the term rabbi, that quite often was associated with uh, spiritual leaders, meant great teacher or my master. And why was that? Well, simply because of the influence that their words carried as teachers. They were revered as, as knowledgeable. They were to be listened to because 
they had access to a higher plane of, of thought and understanding. But you see, with much mana comes much responsibility. Meaning that those in the church who teach others will be judged with greater strictness, as James says. Uh, perhaps James was actually thinking of Jesus' words to the self-exalting Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23. Remember, he said there of the Pharisees that they, they loved to be greeted in the marketplaces and to men have, have them call them rabbi. You see, they, they reveled in their position of influence for their own glory. But in seeing through their self-righteousness, Jesus said they shouldn't be called rabbi or teacher for there is only one true rabbi and teacher, Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus' point was that whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Now James no doubt had the teachers of his day in mind, as I mentioned before. You see, he addressed these words to the leadership of the, the early New Testament church, who, remember, were, were spread far and wide, as we read in the first few verses of James chapter 1. He, he was talking to the elders, to, to the deacons, to the teachers of the church. Be careful, because your words carry much influence. They're able to convince and persuade many, both for good and for bad. But this also has wider application as well. It includes church ministry leaders. It includes mums and dads. Anyone who teaches others in God's word. We're all held to account for the way in which we've influenced others with our words. So James is saying, weigh them up carefully. Hold yourself accountable in what you say to God's word. But before you feel crushed under the weight of your responsibility as a one who teaches, either in the church or at home, James acknowledges in verse 2 that we all stumble in this task. Uh, only the perfect person, after all, James says, could do that perfectly. Which is why he points out that we are being perfected. Only with a, a teachable heart, learning how to bridle the whole body so hugely influenced by the tongue. You see, the tongue has the capacity to influence our whole being, James is saying. It puts shape to our sinful thoughts. It, it verbalizes our wicked desires. It encourages us to carry out evil intentions. As James told us in chapter 1, verse 26, if, if we're not learning to bridle our tongue, we're deceiving our our own hearts, remember. And we're, we're living a religion that's worthless. See, James is telling us that's the influence the tongue has over our whole body if we don't guard what we say. That's why King David reminds us from Psalm 34, which we read earlier, that to, to desire a good life and to love many days is to keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The tongue, it influences our whole being so much so that it's only as we learn to control it by the power of the Spirit will we grow in a blessed life of goodness. Uh, to push the point home and proving the influence that such a small part of our anatomy has over us, James draws our attention to bits and rudders. Uh, I don't know if any of you here have ever ridden a horse. I have before. And it's just amazing to experience that as you're riding the horse with this little bit in its mouth and you holding on to the reins, just with a slight tug either to the right or the left, the whole horse moves the way in which you are directing it. So It's so incredible how such a small piece of equipment has such influence over such a huge beast. Um, for some of you, maybe you've seen a, a big ship up on a dry dock. You see this massive bulk of steel and this, this little tiny rudder underneath. And you think to yourself, how on earth is the captain able to move thousands of tons of metal with this little 
rudder. And now think of the tongue. Such a small part of your body. I looked this up on Google and rather than one muscle, your tongue is actually a whole lot of interconnected, wonderfully engineered muscles. It's an amazing piece of equipment as far as our anatomy goes. It's hugely complex, yet so easily taken for granted. But aside from being used to eat and taste our food, it's so small yet capable of being the thing that guides and steers so much of what you do. And the point James is making is, who's controlling it? Just like the bit that enables the rider to influence where the horse goes or the rudder of a ship, uh, the, the rudder steers the ship wherever the pilot wants it to go. Who's in charge of your tongue? Your tongue, which is so small, yet makes such great boasts. Your tongue, which is like a neon sign that reveals your sinfulness in a split second. If you think about it, the first actual sin after the fall was the sin of speech. You see, the minute God confronted Adam about what he'd done, what was the first thing he did? He blamed Eve, revealing the, the extent of sin's influence over our words. He tried to convince God it wasn't his fault, pleading his innocence straight away with his words. What a great boast he made in the face of God. You see, our words quickly reveal who's in charge of our tongue. At any given moment, are, are you allowing your sinful nature to influence what rolls off your tongue, causing your whole body to follow suit? I mean, think about it. How often are words spoken in anger or bitterness or jealousy, how often are they followed up with hurtful action? And that's what James is warning us today. Guard your tongue. It carries much influence over others and even yourself. But not only does the tongue possess great influence, it also has enormous power for harm. So turning to verse 5, James warns us about words of power. Words of power. In the second part of verse 5, James provides another illustration. This time about how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Now, I've, I've attended a, a few arsons in my days as a cop. And, and I remember attending once a, a suspicious fire of, of this massive warehouse. And it was actually quite frightening being in attendance while the fire was still raging. I mean, the heat, the intense heat and, and the destruction is just, it's enormous. It's true to say that, that fire... It leaves no prisoners. But of all the arsons that I investigated, they always started with a fire source much smaller than the destruction they caused. Uh, sometimes, for example, a faulty switch, or at other times, a small amount of accelerant. And it was always evident such a, a huge amount of destruction from something that began so small. And so it is with our words. A throwaway comment here, words spoken in anger there, such potential for destructive outcomes. <laughs> How often I've said it myself, once they're said, you can't take them back. Our words have the power to tear down. They certainly can make others feel sad and very hurt. In fact, they can also lead to longer-lasting consequences. Our words can actually cause others to suffer depression, even self-harm. Now, I understand we all have a choice in how we respond to hurtful words. But even so, we shouldn't be the one responsible for making that person feel that way. 
In today's day and age, it doesn't even need to be said in person, does it? These days, online bullying, I mean, it's a real thing. And it's a huge problem because we just don't think deeply enough about the, the lasting effect that the spiteful snap or text or email or whatever can have on others. You send it away and you don't think twice about it. But the other person receives it and they stew on it for days, for weeks, months even. Don't do it. What you say, what you text, what you snap, email, it so quickly has the capacity for mass destruction in more ways than one. You see, it's not just in the lives of others that it has the power to destroy. It it even has the power to derail our own Christian walk. James says in verse 6, The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness, setting on fire the entire course of life. Now, I want you to cast your mind back. Remember what James said in chapter 1, verse 20, what he said about ungodly anger that arises because we aren't quick to hear. We aren't slow to speak. And we aren't slow to anger. You see, that kind of anger, remember, doesn't produce the kind of righteousness of God. That kind of ungodly anger, in words spoken, only has the capacity to destroy others and our witness for Christ. It has the power to seriously derail our walk with the Lord. I mean, think of the shame. Think of the regret. Think of the heartache you've caused yourself and seen the damage that your words have caused others. How often you wish you hadn't said that hurtful thing. Why did I let my anger, my my jealousy, my bitterness get the better of me look at the damage I've caused remember words spoken can never be taken back when James says that the tongue sets the whole course of life on fire he's highlighting the potential of its destructive power its destructive power over us The regret, the hurt, the shame. You see, from the minute we're old enough to put sentences together to the minute we die, all the words we speak will and do hold power over us for good and bad. Our tongue, our tongue is a ready instrument in the hands of our sinful desires. In the influences of of the world, and as James James concludes, our tongue is a ready instrument even for Satan himself. That's why he says it it is set on fire even by hell itself. So James' warning, who's in control of your tongue? Is it the evil intent of your own heart? To push the point home, James uses another illustration. The wild animals that man has been given dominion over by God They're tamed by us, able to be tamed by us. From every kind of beast and bird, reptile and sea creature, James says. Yet not the tongue. See, what James is saying, how easily we can rule the wild animals of this world, yet how easily we're ruled by our own tongue. It spouts forth deadly poison. It's restless. And quoting from Psalm 5 verse 9, the Apostle Paul describes the unrighteous as those whose throats are an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps, another word for serpents, is under their lips. How quickly our tongue has the power to destroy with venomous power. And that's what James here is reiterating. In a moment, it lashes out in anger and hatred and bitterness. Untamed in its relentless capacity for destruction. See, James is saying, don't let your tongue be controlled 
by the sinful desires, the sinful inclinations of your own heart. It's destructive. Well, James has so far pointed out that the incredible influence of our words, not only over others, but also ourselves, but also the, the destructive power it possesses. And now James leads us to consider how fragile the integrity of our Christian walkness and witness is as he points to words of integrity. Words of integrity. James says in verse 9 that with our tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. You see, to, to bless God with your words one minute and then to curse someone, I mean, it's just plain wrong. It's plain wrong to do that as a Christian. Now, to, to bless God is to praise him, to thank him for all that he is as our God. We're probably not so familiar with what it means to curse someone. Uh, essentially, it means to wish or bring bad against someone else. And it's not just about cursing people with, with voodoo dolls and, and things like that. We curse people when we gossip or, or we speak dishonestly about them. When we say words that, that hurt their reputation and bring bad upon them, that's to curse people. And whether someone speaks badly about you or not, it's not your job to put them in their place and administer your own bit of street justice by speaking badly about them. To do that is to deny the gospel of God's mercy and goodness to you in Christ. Remember, justice belongs to the Lord. Remember those words of Jesus? Bless those who curse you. Desire their good that the very God who made them might show them the same undeserved mercy that God showed you. You see, God, he hates it when we distort the gospel of his mercy, of his mercy to us and our, and our prejudice and our unjust comments when we purposely tear others down. James says, my brothers, this ought not to be so. We should always speak of the other person in a way that honours them as a fellow human being made by God. The integrity of your gospel witness, it's affected when you don't. You become a, a contradiction, a, a hypocrite. That's why James says in the verses 11 and 12, as Christians, a spring, a spring can't produce both fresh water and salt water. And neither can a, a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine figs. Remember the words that, that roll off your tongue are always going to reflect to what degree the gospel is taking root in your life. You see, words that come from a spring of fresh water, they taste nice. Words that come from a spring of salt water, they taste taste bitter the original meaning for the word salt water actually refers to brackish waters water that tastes bitter and so the question is brothers and sisters are you am i are we filled with sweet words that come from living out the gospel or do you and i speak the bitter tasting words of the sinful nature See, James says a salt pond, it can't produce fresh water. And so when you allow your heart to be swept up by sinful reactions that come from a place of spite or, or bitterness or whatever ungodly emotional motive, the, the words that roll off your tongue, they're going to follow suit. Brooding on the hurt that someone caused you in the past, fueling spiteful thoughts by continually dwelling on them, Hold on, holding on to ongoing resentment towards a work colleague, quite naturally will probably spew out in ungodly words that do your witness for Jesus no good at all. 
See, they won't be pleasing words fueled by the gospel of God's love, which brings forth words of peace, of contentment, and joy. James Point, bitterness and sweetness, they don't flow out together. A fig tree doesn't bear olives. A grapevine doesn't produce figs. Brothers and sisters, that's why, out of the abundance of God's grace, he sent his son to perfectly and without fault speak the sweet words of the gospel in every situation on our behalf. Words of love, of kindness, of compassion. Remember how James said earlier that we all stumble in verse 1. None of us are perfect, in other words. But there was one who was. Jesus. The most comforting words he spoke for the assurance of our salvation as imperfect speakers of the gospel were in his final words that he spoke on the cross. It is finished. Three little words that confirmed and sealed our pardon and his salvation. Out of his love for the Father and for us, Jesus received God's just judgment for our sins on our behalf. The guilt, the shame, the condemnation of our sins dealt with forever confirmed in those three little words. It is finished. Meaning that the fire of unrighteousness our tongues are capable of have been renewed by a different kind of fire. A fire that came from heaven and rested on the New Testament believers at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit. The outworking of the first sin after the fall, remember I said, was in the speech of Adam. It wasn't my fault, it was hers. But at Pentecost, we see the first act of newly created hearts in Christ as the act of of God honouring speech. Remember, as all the believers received the sign of the Holy Spirit, they spoke of the mighty works of God to them in Christ in other languages. And so as new creations in Christ by the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, you and I have been given the power to speak the words that our tongues were originally created for. To speak words that bring glory and honor to the God who made you and calls you to love others as he first loved you. As newly made people by faith in Christ, what you say and how you say it reflects who you have been made in him. A saved, a redeemed sinner given the gift of the Holy Spirit to speak words that bring him all the glory. Do you hear what James is saying to you today? Guard your tongue. It has great capacity for influence. It has massive potential for destruction. And when used badly, your tongue will never negatively impact the integrity of your Christian walk and witness. Use it, brothers and sisters, instead for the good God created it. And pray, pray that you'll speak the words of Jesus that bring God all the glory. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you have given us the gift of speech, the gift of words, uh, the gift of communication unique to us as humans. And we thank you that made in your likeness, Father, although we are sinful, uh, you have given us the capacity to speak words that bring you glory and bless others. We pray that you would help us do that um, through the saving work of Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's stand then to sing in response to the preaching of God's word. Number 389, the verses 1 to 3 and 5. Lord, speak to me that I may speak and will remain standing for the benediction.
receive now these words of the Lord's parting blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And all God's people said, Amen. And we're very thankful that uh, Margaret has been playing for us this morning and she has uh, agreed to use her gifts for the ministry of the church. So we're very thankful for that and for indeed all the musicians that uh, accompany us in our worship and praise of God. Let's then sing together as we uh, finish off number 370, the verses 1 to 2. Saviour again to thy dear name we raise.